All right, here we go. Brand new Flyers Daily for the 7th of June, 2024. Flyers Daily is always presented by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live. We're actually going to put, we're going to do a little pivot here. We're going to put our Flyers Exit Day interview series on pause for the day. Uh, because Keith Jones, president of Hockey Operations and the CEO of Comcast Spectacore and chairman of the Philadelphia Flyers, Dan Hilferty, met with the media on Wednesday. And I had a chance to sit down with Dan Hilferty after that media uh, conference and have a little one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I think you're going to really enjoy it. We got to know Dan Hilferty a, a, a decent amount this past season. Got to know him a little bit more on Wednesday in that press conference. And you'll get to know a little bit more about Dan Hilferty uh, with our conversation coming up in just a couple of minutes. But before we get there, real quick, a couple of things um, just I want to go over really quickly. The I saw this today. I woke up this morning or yesterday morning, as it were, uh, to a tweet uh, from a guy named Sunstroke PH, PHL. And he said, I'm going to credit at Jason Mert with manifesting this. First person I heard mention an idea exactly like this in an effort to grow the game of hockey. And he was replying to a tweet from ESPN's Greg Wyshynski talking about a new series that is coming out on Amazon, a docu-series. It is from the producers of Drive to Survive, um, and it'll be an NHL series, on, a docu-series on Amazon. I have cited Drive to Survive so many times and something like that for the NHL many times on this podcast, my other one, Stick to Hockey, and on the radio for years. It's a great way to grow the game, and here is why. It allows people... To see the life of a hockey player, not all of it, we're not going to get everything, but you're going to get a lot more than you've gotten um, beyond the play on the sheet of ice. Now, there's probably going to be a lot of elements and interactions with the players that are featured and their teammates and opponents and all of that stuff, which is great. And there will be some on-ice stuff and mic'd up moments, I'm sure. But the key is that hockey players, by nature, a lot of them are funny. Um, a lot of them have a lot more complexities to their personality in life than just work hard, get pucks deep, got to win 50 fit, all that stuff. There's a lot more to them as people. And in a sport where no pe nobody lets one person get too big. And we're going to see some of the biggest names in the game featured on this series. I mean, the key players right now, Oilers captain, Connor McDavid, the number one overall pick in 2015. He's in the Stanley Cup final. A guy he's going to be playing against, Matthew Kachuk. Vastly different personalities. I don't know anything about Connor McDavid. I know nothing about him. First of all, he's buried in Edmonton. Of course, he's in the Cup final. We'll learn more now. But games are on late at night. I know he's a great, great hockey player. I know nothing about his personality. And I want to get to know that. I think to sell the game's biggest stars, you've got to get to know the game's biggest stars. Matthew Kachuk's another one of them. He's a guy that is incredibly agitating on the ice. What's he like off the ice? What's he like the other 21 hours of a game day? You're going to get a look at Jacob Truba, who is an absolute warrior on the ice, competitive. Uh, you're going to get Leon Dreisaitl, a third overall pick by the Edmonton Oilers. How about David Posternock from the Czech uh, from, Czech, Czech, from the Czech Republic, Jeremy Swayman. We'll get a goaltender in there from the Boston Bruins, Quinn Hughes. Uh, how about Jack Eichel, two great American players there. William Nylander from the Toronto uh, Maple Leafs. Philip Forsberg from the Preds. And uh, Gabriel Landeskog uh, from the Avalanche, amongst others. The crews will be embedded with the players. The crews are already embedded with McDavid and Kachuk and their teammates, families, and friends during the Oilers-Panthers quest for this year's Stanley Cup. So I, I think, massive, it's about time you listen to me. This is a great way to, sh to grow the game. When they did the Road to the Winter Classic way back in 2012, I believe it was, people in this town fell in love with Pierre Laviolette because they got way more beyond his press conferences. They got to see the man in his environment. And fans fell in love with it. You know, I'm not putting up with it. What's the problem now? All that stuff. 
That stuff, people want, we are voyeurs by nature. We want to peek behind the curtain. We want to know what it's like. How do these players, you know, what do they do in their travel? What's the travel like on the plane? What are their meals like? What's, what's the road like? What are the interactions with teammates that are just natural like? That stuff grows the game. So I'm very, very happy to see that the producers of Drive to Survive are teaming up with the NHL and Amazon uh, to do this new NHL docu-series. I tweeted out also uh, kind of a, a teaser video to it. You can check it out on my Twitter, at Jason Mert, J-A-S-O-N-M-Y-R-T. So I'm ecstatic about this show coming out. After we get to Dan Hilferty, we're going to look at um, the two teams in the cup final and just kind of look how they were built because it's so different. And there's this notion out there now that, well, Connor McDavid made a final. Aaron Ekblad's a number one overall pick. You've got to tank to get better. I say BS. Um, I'm still never going to want to tank. Again, it's a loser's mentality. All right, let's get to our feature interview. Wednesday, Keith Jones and our guest met with the media, kind of put a bow on last year, the first year of the new era of Orange, and also kind of looking ahead to some arena projects, things that will interest the fans from a spectator standpoint, and also get to know the man a little bit more, the chairman of Comcast Spectacor, the chairman of the Flyers and CEO of Comcast Spectacor. Here's my conversation with Dan Hilferty. You guys, you and Keith Jones met with the media um, to kind of put a bow on this past season, the, the first new era of orange season and heading into year two. Uh, when you look back, there, there were so many memorable moments, but what have you learned about the people that you work with over that year? Well, I, I'm so happy to hear you say that. Um, I, it just, I, I didn't know what to expect. I, I've been around professional sports, but not in it like you have been and, and others in the organiza- around the organization. Um, three things. One, I have been so impressed with the three leaders of the hockey side. Keith Jones, Danny Breer, and his role as GM, and John Tortorella. Um, there's a level of passion. There's a level of humility. Uh, there's a level of willingness to share to make things better. That that was my first impression. On the business side, same thing. And I mentioned in the recent press conference that uh, Jonesy and I have really focused on breaking down walls between the business side and the hockey side. That has gone extremely well. Nothing's perfect, but it's going extremely well. The next thing is I've been so impressed with not only the assistant coaches and the way they go about their business, the, the training staff, uh, everyone who, who, who is around the organization. And then to meet these players um, and to be accepted and to realize that they have that same type of uh, persona that I see in, in their leaders, Jonesy, Danny, and, and Torts, uh, they're, they're personable. Um, they are respectful of each other. They uh, have a good time together, um, but they're down to earth, uh, down to earth professionals who want to win and want to do something special for this region. So I'd say all in all that from my perspective, it has been um, really uh, a, a happy outcome to just see how well I feel that I fit in with a group of genuine good people. Throughout my career, you know, you have all different types of bosses. And I've always said that you can learn more from a bad boss than you can a good boss. You can take things from them. And leadership, you just mentioned it in those three key areas that you brought up. And leadership is paramount. You got to go in eyes wide open, but you also got to be, you know, as a leader, willing to say, I don't have to do everything, empowering other people to do them. When you need me, come to me. I will be there to support you. What is leadership for you? I, I, leadership is, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I think um, you mentioned Ocean City and, and the roots. The reason we moved to Ocean City was my father passed away. My mother decided she was wanted to get away from the hustle and bustle of, of uh, suburban Philadelphia, and we, we moved to the Jersey Shore. Um, what, what I learned as a, a young man growing up with a strong mother but no father is that the the key thing you have to do you have to figure out how to build relationships with people mm-hmm. and and i've done that throughout my life and like you said i've learned from the good people i've interacted with i've learned from folks that maybe you take it all did, in don't you? You, you just take it all yeah. in so to sum it up the way i look at leadership i've realized over the years that i have a set of skills a, sk- a set of gifts 
also have a set of deficiencies or a set of mm. blind spots. That I you try to about. mitigate those. You try to mitigate those. Yeah. How do you best mitigate them? By surrounding yourself, being with people who have strengths in areas where you maybe aren't as strong, have a perspective that maybe you don't have. And it's the, it's the willingness, as you said, to listen and to, mm -hmm. to be open to learning. So I, that's my basic philosophy about leadership. Um, I know when I need to, uh, I don't bang on the table, but say this is the way it's going to be. You got to be but, hard sometimes. But that's rare. Yeah. That's rare because if you have a group of people that you're confident in, when they knowing when they should stand up and you knowing when you need to stand up, it, 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 it works. It creates that the culture is an over, overused term, but it creates that culture. Nothing's perfect. I always say that, but a culture of trust, a culture of uh, accountability and a culture of mutual, uh, mutual, you know, mutual goal of being successful, regardless of what the endeavor is. Hockey's no different than yeah. running in this regard, in that regard, no different than running a $30 billion company. Yeah. Dan, the one thing is, is in sports and in a company, you're throwing curveballs all the time. You don't get this clear path that's going to be no squeaky wheels along the way. You guys had that this year, whether it was the Cutter Gauthier situation and the acquisition of Jamie Drysdale, Fedotov eventually comes over. You're dealing with it now to some degree with the Meechkov situation. Um, when you go into those things and you have to deal with the stresses, is that when you find out the most about people, when how they react when the you know what hits the fan? Yeah, it's. I, I'm glad you asked that question, Jay. I in I felt in healthcare. Um, not that I, I'm certainly not a clinician, but the decisions we were making impacted people's lives in a mm -hmm. direct way. When you're talking about your your physical or behavioral or mental health, you here it, it's you don't have that. But at the same time, it's a very public it's a very public environment, which comes with the stress, sports, which comes with a level of stress. What I realized early on, not only on the business side, because a lot of the folks had come from the sports and entertainment side of industry but on on the hockey side um uh, you know keith and danny have played in big time games over their careers they they've been in front of 20 30 000 people in a in a stressful situation towards same thing they they so they they have their battle tested right it's perform or go home it's perform or go <laughs> home so I, never once have i seen panic in any in any of those situations yeah. you articulated, it's just simply and, and Jonesy says something that I, um, I I just all three of them I admire them so much. But Jonesy said to me we were talking about one of those situations that you referenced, and and he said, "Hell, it's just hockey. We'll figure it out." Yeah. And and so for me, uh, yeah, I, I am really confident in that these battle tested professionals who respect what I bring to the table that together together with a, a strong team of uh, Barry Hanrahan, uh, uh, others who, who can help us make the decisions, the right decisions for the franchise. Everybody says they want to win. It's easy to say it. It's harder to do. What is in your eyes, you have so much experience in varying industries. What is the chemistry of a winner? And sometimes the winner is not the guy who takes home the trophy. The, you can win in other ways, but what is the chemistry of a winner? For, for me, the chemistry of, of a winner, look, wins and losses matter. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's that's just not sports. That's any any industry you can name. But wins and losses matter. But but for me is creating an environment, being part of an environment where there's a level of trust. There's a level of a sense of humor about what you're doing. There's a willingness to share. There's a willingness to accept as a group blame for things that don't go well, and at the same time, celebrate together the things that go well. Um, I'm convinced that through building that collaborative culture, building that environment of excellence, that's why uh, you look at what's going on at the practice facility is so important. We want to create an environment that is best in class. By doing that, so something, um, I'm going to use this term, something magical happens. Uh, I believe it. Um, people might say I have rose colored glasses uh, at looking at these things, but I firmly believe if you keep building positives around the core of an enterprise, the core of a, a group of people trying to accomplish greatness, it happens. I remember reading an interview with Mark Cuban or listening to it years ago when he had the Dallas Mavericks. And he said, I have a salary cap. I can only pay, pay my players so much. 
But when they come here, they're going to have every amenity. Everything's going to be first class in the plane, the hotels, in their locker stall. They're going to have the latest Xbox and PlayStation. I don't even care if they play it, but it'll be there and they'll know it and that they're taken care of. You guys have upgraded this practice facility a ton already. More upgrades are happening. Same thing at Wells Fargo Center. The new locker room is frankly stunning. Those things matter to players, upgrading all of that. How do you spread the word? I, I've always, an old radio guy, I go, tell them you're going to do it. Do yeah, it yeah, well. Yeah, tell yeah. them you did it. <laughs> and, and keep telling them yeah. you did it. And the, the word spreads by... Um, I noticed, especially when, when we're on the road, um, and I, I loved going on the road. I, you really get to know people. Uh, you, you, you've yeah. seen it. You yeah. just get to know people as you, as you travel for these uh, away uh, road trips. Um, players from teams congregate afterwards. An old friend who you played with in juniors, uh, a guy that you were, you were both traded from a team, and they talk. Yeah. And so what we're seeing is – these players led led by Sean, Sean Couturier and uh, they 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 really see what's happening. They like what happened is happening. Their families are included and involved and they're the best. They're the best ambassadors for what we're trying Word to do. And so but to your point coming from radio and I remember your radio days, the, the, the best point is. Keep saying it, keep saying it, but actually do it and yeah. as you do it the word will get out and then when we get to a point to go sign that big free agent and that will come hopefully it'll be a no-brainer for them yeah i thought that when the flyers traded sean walker my crazy brain goes well he really liked being here but he's going to be a great messenger out there to infiltrate other players he, 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 he really <laughs> he really is yeah. and, and the fact that i think he's up for for right. a, a contract well, the way he played, his contribution in, in Colorado, you, you wish the best yeah. to, to Sean and, and the rest of his career. And spread and the that word. Itself, <laughs> that itself will be a message of, hey, Philadelphia is a place you want you want to be. Dan, enjoy the rest of the summer. Thanks for doing Jason, this. I can't wait for – like I'm miserable already because I'm waiting for the season. It's only hockey season and hockey all season. <laughs> no spring, summer, fall in my book. I'm learning that. I'm learning that. And I'm, but enjoy I'm the time. It. Yeah, you as well. Thanks to Dan Hilferty for taking the time Wednesday to uh, sit down and have a conversation with us. Um, the more I get to know Dan, I can see why he's a great leader. He's very inspiring. He's very empowering. What I kind of said in the beginning of that interview is, you know, great leaders – hire people to do their job and they let them do their job they don't lean over their shoulder and question their decisions and question their thought process if they need the big boss to help them with something they'll come to them if they have that respect that a great leader shows and dan helfrey certainly has that he's been a winner even though it hasn't been on the field of play with sports his entire life uh, in business, he's been a leader for a very long time. I remember when he first got hired, a couple of people reached out to me that knew Dan, that worked with him uh, on other projects, whether it was the World Cup coming to Philadelphia or some people that knew him um, through being in the neighborhood, a guy I went to college with, and they had rave reviews. And I think that we can all feel pretty confident in the way that he is leading this franchise and allowing people to do their jobs. Great to see. Thanks to Dan Hilferty uh, for joining us on this episode of Flyers Daily. Okay, on to the cup final real quick because it's Edmonton versus Florida. These two de teams could not have, be built, not have been built in different ways if you tried. It is astounding. You look at Edmonton, we know about all the number one overall picks that they had, whether it was Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Neil Yakupov, Connor McDavid, uh, Taylor Hall. I think they had four in six years, and they really didn't go anywhere with it. Obviously, a couple of those guys aren't there anymore, and Yakupov and Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall did win a Hart Trophy when he left, uh, but you do have a number one overall pick in Connor McDavid. Still, Ryan Nugent Hopkins is there, and a third overall pick in Leon Dreisaitl. So some really top of the draft players and then you look at you know on the back end you have some some defensemen there that were were guys that were taken pretty high as well uh, Bouchard was taken 10th overall 
selected in the first round in the 18 draft. And then you look at uh, a guy like Darnell Nurse was seventh overall in the 2013 draft. They may leave a little something to be desired in net, uh, but we'll see if they can keep that structure that has gotten them to the cup finals. But it, it, this is incredible when you look at some of the numbers. 23 players have played at least one postseason game for the Edmonton Oilers. 23 so far through the first three rounds. Ten of them were selected by Edmonton in the NHL draft. Eight of them, eight of them have been signed via free agency, and five of them were acquired via trade. So, team that's been supplemented, but 10 players in the cup final of, of 23 were drafted by the Edmonton Oilers. Then you go to Florida, and this is where it's so interesting. 21 players have played at least one postseason game for the Panthers through their first three rounds. Nine of those players were signed in free agency. Eight were acquired via trade, and three, only three, were selected by Florida in the NHL draft, and one was claimed on waivers. That's astounding. That's an incredible number. Go back to the year before. You look at the Las Vegas Golden Knights and how they were built. Now, it's a little different because they were obviously, they still have players that were taken in an expansion draft, but some very key pieces, whether it's Eichel traded uh, from Buffalo to Vegas or Petrangelo, who, who makes his way out to, uh, to Las Vegas, uh, players all through the lineup, Mark Stone via Ottawa. It, teams can be built in different ways, very different ways. This notion that you have to tank to get high-end talent, it's just not true. Does it make your chances better, obviously, to get a player like Connor McDavid? Of course it does. But, I mean, this is nine years now into Connor McDavid's career. That's a long, long time that it's taken after they had four or five number one overall picks in six, seven years. You look at a team like the Dallas Stars and how they're built. You know, they got the old veterans that are there, whether it's Jamie Benn, who was drafted in the fifth round back in 2007, or you've got a guy in, who wasn't even taken by the Dallas Stars, Tyler Sagan, 32 years of age. Sagan was the top of the draft guy, second overall. Yet Pavelski was taken back in the 2003 draft in the seventh round. And then you look at some really important players for this Dallas team. Now, now we know about Miro Heiskanen because... That's the player that could have been for the Flyers in the 2017 NHL draft when the Flyers took Nolan Patrick second overall. But the real key ones for this Dallas team are Jason Robertson. He was taken in that 2017 draft as well. Seven, in the second round, 39th overall. Wow. Jake Ottinger also taken in that 2017 draft first round. 26th overall and the guy who's really just busted onto the scene is Wyatt Johnson 20 years of age taken in the 2021 draft first round 23rd overall you can find talent in the NHL draft you have to draft well you have to develop and you have to you have to frankly hit above the NHL average Dallas has done that if you look back and you look at Edmonton with 10 players that they drafted, they obviously have done that to an extent as well. Some of those are really high in the draft, and they stunk for years. But there are different ways to do this. It doesn't have to be burn it down to the studs and rebuild it. I made the mistake. I was on Facebook, and one of the posts that came up in my feed was from uh, a Flyers fan page or some page affiliated uh, with covering the Flyers. And people were saying they need to trade TK, they need to trade Cooch, they need to trade Farabee. We're in a rebuild, aren't we? Yeah, but you got to start building and keeping some pieces as well. And you can't have a team that's all the same age. I just don't know what is so hard to understand about that. I am a big believer that the known commodity is greater 
sometimes, most times, than the unknown commodity. People love the unknown because they assume, well, if I trade this guy for a first-round pick, that first-round pick is going to be great. That's not the case. The numbers don't belie that fact. Sometimes you're trading that guy, and whatever you draft, it's just not going to work out. It may be no fault of your own. The player doesn't work out. The player gets hurt. The player doesn't adjust to being a pro, an NHL player, whatever. It doesn't always work. People love draft picks. It's like, a, it's like buying the lottery ticket before the numbers are drawn. You can drive around with the ticket and go, well, I got a Powerball ticket here for $750 million. And I wonder what I, who would I call first if I won it? Well, I think people have that feeling when it comes to draft picks as well. They, just, they want the feeling of we're going to get something great. It doesn't always work out. There are different ways to build a team. Flyers are in a rebuild. One thing that was brought up on Wednesday with Keith Jones is, hey, there's, there's got to be incremental steps forward, but there's not big leaps yet. This isn't the offseason for big leaps. I'm not predicting big leap of improvement this offseason, but I think there does need to be improvement this offseason, and the team does need to move in that direction. They got so, The cap this summer is not great for them. They had a lot of dead money, and... You know, Cal Peterson, a guy who's been in the AHL, $5 million contract, that's all going to clear next summer. And then they can really be in business. Michkov is obviously an X factor. They did not have an update on Matt Faye Michkov, but it was clear in what Keith Jones said that, hey, they were prepared for him to fulfill his three-year contract in the Continental Hockey League with SKA. If he comes over early, that's gravy. And they would love to get him here early. We'll see how that plays out. Um, not a ton of control in that situation for the Philadelphia Flyers. But that's going to do it for this week's episodes. Uh, we'll be back next week. We will reschedule Nick Sealer. I, I, I love talking to Nick Sealer. Such a genuine guy. And you're really going to enjoy the conversation as well. We still have Nick Sealer to come then. Uh, Travis Sanheim, J- Jamie Drysdale, 3D. Uh, Tyson Forrester, Bobby Brink, and Noah Cates on our Flyers Exit Day interview series. And Monday, Bill Meltzer will join us for his weekly visit and the cup final will be underway. Lots to discuss. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Be safe, and we'll talk to you Monday on a brand-new Flyers Daily.